Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Mandalorians are supposed to be one of the most badass warrior races in the entire galaxy. Din Djarin has shown us on several occasions now that a Mandalorian in full Beskar is essentially an invulnerable tank. So why are the Mandalorians a uh, displaced people? How did the Empire drive them off with their inferior stormtroopers and plastoid armor? Well, it turns out the Mandalorians and the planet of the Mandalore has some pretty significant disadvantages, which kind of make it very hard to defend this planet. In one of our last videos, we talked about who the Darksaber should belong to. This is the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, and Bo-Katan had formerly wielded the weapon and then lost it to the Empire during what's known as the Great Purge. Now, we have very little detail about what happened during the Great Purge, but we know it was devastating to the Mandalorian population. One event we know about is called the Night of a Thousand Tears, which involves a bunch of Imperial gunships armed with heavy repeating blasters attacking training fields full of Mandalorian recruits. The Empire would then seize and melt down all of the armor of the fallen Mandalorians who rebelled against them. It was such a terrible moment in Mandalorian history that the Children of the Watch started believing that their home planet was actually cursed. And so, even someone as badass as Din Djarin will think twice before heading back to his home planet. Now, at the time, we kind of blamed Bo-Katan for this disastrous event. She was, after all, the leader of Mandalore, especially after Sabine Wren gifted her the Darksaber. But I'm beginning to realize that Bo-Katan never really had much of a chance in succeeding in her mission. Well, let's take a look at why. Mandalore is located in the Outer Rim Territory. It's a planet with 19 standard hour days and 366 days in a year. The planet's diameter is 9,200 kilometers, roughly three-fourths the size of Earth. At one point in time, Mandalore was quite a lush planet covered in vegetation. Uh, there were mountains and forests and all sorts of different biomes for the different fauna that lived on the planet. The warlike nature of the Mandalorian people resulted in several cataclysmic wars on the planet that left wide swaths of the surface uninhabitable. Around 738 BBY, the Old Republic and Jedi Order decided to preemptively attack Mandalore, and by preemptive I mean without provocation. The Republic had become alarmed by the growing technological prowess and military might of the Mandalorians and their refusal to join the Republic. It was overall a pretty uncalled for attack by the Jedi and the Republic, but the results were devastating. The Mandalorians that remained on their home planet were forced to withdraw into dumb cities because the entire surface of their planet was no longer inhabitable and now a toxic wasteland. Now, Dave Filoni has actually canonized this event. We just don't know the specifics like we do in Legends, like what year it happens, but this is definitely an event it's created a lot of tension between the Jedi and Old Republic and the Mandalorians, obviously. The Mandalorian people were already facing a major decline before the Jedi and Republic attacked them, though. The Mandalorian Crusades during the Old Republic period were massive and had represented the peak of Mandalorian power. But their power and conquest drew the ire and fear of the entire Republic, and after each great crusade, there was a great scattering of Mandalorian forces after they were inevitably defeated. By the time of the Clone Wars, the once mighty Mandalorian people had been whittled down to a population of only 4 million people living on Mandalore and another 412 living on the moon of Concordia. Some other small outposts still existed in the rest of the Mandalorian system, but essentially they were depleted in manpower. Not only did the Mandalorian suffer far too many casualties, a lifetime of warfare and killing also meant that a significant portion of the population never had the time to settle down and make babies. And so you had very little population growth as a result. Then you had organizations like the True Mandalorians and Children of the Watch who mainly recruited by gathering orphans from the battlefield. Not exactly a sustainable way of maintaining your population growth. So the average Mandalorian warrior is basically like those units and strategy games that cost a lot of resources but are also super, super powerful. The Empire, on the other hand, was more Zerg-like in nature quality over quantity. So while a Mandalorian's armor might be worth 20 Stormtroopers worth of armor, it doesn't mean that a single Mandalorian can actually take on 20 Stormtroopers and win that battle. So once the Republic and Jedi launched that very sneaky preemptive attack on Mandalore, they essentially took over the local governance of the planet and system. This kind of opened the way for a new organization called the New Mandalorians. These individuals rejected all past Mandalorian culture and traditions and understandably saw these traditions as regressive things that led to the destruction of their world. Their leader, Satine Kryze, believed that the future of Mandalore was modernization and pacifism. Ironically, she had to fight a bloody civil war against the Death Watch in order to secure her vision of peace. With the new Mandalorians in charge, Mandalore essentially demilitarized. 
The Republic and Jedi had already destroyed the majority of the Mandalorian's naval fleets, and now, with the new Mandalorians in charge, the tradition of wearing armor and weapons around in public at all times started fading away. Which is kind of bad because you essentially lose Mandalore's biggest strategic uh, asset, which is a gigantic armed civilian militia, because everyone was basically ready to die for Mandalore at any given time. And with such a low population, that was really the only way Mandalore could defend itself, with a high percentage of the population serving in the military, or at least in some kind of civil defense force. Mandalore would also need to have a pretty large and powerful navy so it could defend the system. Otherwise, the enemy forces can just bombard you from orbit, which I imagine is what really happened during the Great Purge. You just had some ISDs shooting down onto all of those cities. Duchess Satine Cries would try to modernize the Mandalorian economy, but with the start of the Clone Wars, trade relations and routes began breaking up all across the galaxy. The Duchess sat at the head of the Council of Neutral Systems, a political organization with over 1,500 star systems as members. Duchess Satine was the most visible symbol of this movement, and because of that, Mandalore would go on to suffer. The Separatist Alliance maintained trade relations with only those who supported their cause, and the same could be said for the Republic. And so, with the war raging all over the place, causing chaos, food shortages, shortages in essential food supplies, neutral planets like Mandalore were usually given very low priority for, you know, uh, any kind of emergency supplies. As the Clone Wars became more intense, the planet started suffering shortages of basic goods, which actually forced some individuals and governments to open up a very lucrative black market trade on the planet for smuggled supplies. This is really one of the major strategic disadvantages that Mandalore has, and that's that it's not really able to sustain the population of the planet by itself. It really does need outside help and outside resources. And in the terms of a longer siege or blockade, this means that Mandalore probably can't last very long. Imperial forces could technically just blockade the planet and wait for the Mandalorians to starve. And as awesome as Beskar is, you can't really eat it. Ultimately, the Mandalorians were just too dangerous. When your people's everyday clothing involves donning a suit of armor on made out of impenetrable metal, you're going to attract a lot of negative attention. If the Mandalorians were a bit more docile, a bit more willing to collaborate, and maybe a little less militant, perhaps the Great Purge would have never happened. Sure, they still would have been enslaved by the Empire, but they probably wouldn't have been nearly as devastated. But ultimately, Sabine Wren and Bo-Katan's rebellion proved to be such a headache that the Empire was forced to bring the big stick down. While individual Mandalorians are strong and hard to defeat, the Mandalorian people were small players on the wider galactic playing field, especially by the time of the Clone Wars. The Mandalorians always punched extremely hard, they always punched upwards, and as a result, this drew a lot of negative attention in their direction, far too much for their planet and for their culture to withstand. So as awesome as the Mandalorians are, as cool as their armor is, as, as fun as it is for us to watch them, they're just not really a well-designed society. And because of that, you're gonna have a lot of major issues. And this is why we probably uh, should give Bo-Katan a bit of a pass uh, when it comes to losing uh, Mandalore to the Empire. The reality was she probably at most only had a few thousand soldiers uh, under her control, and the Empire just could just, you know, they could basically flood in stormtroopers, they can flood in star destroyers, there's no way she could win a conventional war against the Empire. Anyway guys, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Are there strategies that the uh, Mandalorians could have taken in order to defeat the Empire? Who knows? Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.